What would it be like if ocean liners became a reliable means of transit once again? I know the first thought that comes to your mind is probably definitely not. They are a thing of the past. Airplanes are better. End of discussion. But I don't think that's the end of the discussion. I have a few arguments to make about how ocean liners might actually return in the future. But first, here is the obligatory explanation about the differences between an ocean liner and a cruise ship, for the people who are watching and don't know the difference. And yes, I need to explain this for the rest of the video to make sense. For those new to this topic, RMS Titanic was an ocean liner, not a cruise ship. The difference is that ocean liners were designed to get you from point A to point B and do it on a reliable schedule. A cruise ship might take you from Florida to the Bahamas, but if extreme weather rolls in, the cruise line will do everything it can to either sail around the bad weather, even if it means getting to the port much later than usual, or they'll even cancel the trip to the port. Ocean liners did not have that kind of flexibility. If you needed to get from New York to Southampton and a massive North Atlantic storm was in your way, the ship needed to sail right through it. This is why ocean liners were constructed differently. The hull extended much higher above the waterline than that of modern cruise ships to better withstand massive waves. As a result, they also put their lifeboats much higher up for protection. Ocean liners developed more robust steel frames and maintained thicker steel plates all the way around the ship than cruise ships have. This was so the ship could withstand the rigorous flexing when they crested huge swells. Ocean liners needed to get to their destinations as quickly as possible to compete with other lines, so the ships would progressively be built faster through the decades. Ships like RMS Queen Mary and SS United States had a service speed of 29 knots, which was just a regular speed they maintained across the ocean. The fastest cruise ships in the world would be quite lucky if they could reach 25 knots at full speed. Queen Mary's top speed was almost 33 knots, and SS United States was officially recorded to reach just over 38 knots. You can also see a difference on the exterior of the ships. Ocean liners had longer bows that were designed to cut through massive ocean swells, whereas cruise ships have shorter bows designed for riding over a wave at a slower speed. Ocean liners have stepped sterns designed for breaking up the impact of a wave that might slam into its aft end, whereas a cruise ship will develop a stern that best suits its passenger capacity. I don't say all of this to make cruise ships seem weak, I'm simply stating facts. Cruise ships were designed for leisure and entertainment, while ocean liners were designed for getting people to a destination as fast as possible. While a cruise ship might just survive the worst that the sea can throw at it, an ocean liner will get through it with minimal disruption to its voyage and its passengers. I doubt it's any mystery why ocean liners are not a significant transport industry anymore. They were replaced by something much faster and statistically safer, airliners. The end of the 1960s also saw the end of the ocean liner industry, though some stragglers remained, offering pleasure cruises to popular destinations while storms raged on the North Atlantic. It got to the point where by the late 1990s and early 2000s, the only remaining ocean liner still doing transatlantic crossings on a regular schedule was Cunard's Queen Elizabeth II, also known as the QE2. As the ship approached the end of its service life, there would be a big question looming over the heads of Cunard and fans of ocean liners. Will there be another? As it turns out, there would be. Cunard ended up putting in an order for a successor that they would call Queen Mary II, and at the time of her maiden voyage in the year 2004, she was the largest, fastest, and most luxurious passenger ship on the ocean. She took over the task of doing regularly scheduled transatlantic crossings, and continued long after QE2 was retired in the year 2008. The year 2024 will see the luxurious Queen Mary II reach her 20-year milestone, and she's still a classy-looking ship two decades after going into service. Most passenger ships only see an average of 20 years in service. Queen Mary II, as it so happens, is the last remaining ocean liner still serving as a liner. So as QM2 reaches the halfway point in her service life, people are starting to wonder yet again, will there be another? Not only do I think there will be another, I'm starting to see ways that other cruise ship lines might want to jump on that proverbial ship before it sails. First of all, let's talk about air travel. 
Many of you have been on a plane before, but for those who haven't yet, let me explain a few pros and cons. Pro, you can practically fly anywhere in the world, including over major oceans. Con, you are stuffed into a metal tube with about 200 other people and hardly have any room to stretch out. Pro, if traveling a distance of a thousand miles or more, you get to your destination faster than any other transportation method, including the time it takes to get into the airport terminal and wait for takeoff. Con, getting into the terminal, particularly if you live in the United States, is one of the most stressful and time-consuming transit obligations you'll ever do. I'm out of pros, so we'll continue with cons. Con, bad weather can either cancel your flight or even redirect it mid-air. Con, food on airplanes is often terrible. Con, people who are sensitive to altitude changes and whose ears don't pop easily, like mine, can be in pain throughout the whole flight. Con, you can pay a hefty price and select the seat you most desire, only for you to later be bumped to a worse seat and still expected to pay the same high price. It's true, it recently happened to a friend of mine. Con, you may really despise the person you're forced to sit next to for one to 16 hours. Con, there's no room in the overhead compartment for your carry-on luggage. Con, you breathe the same air everyone else immediately around you is breathing out. That includes any other kinds of winds they release. Con. You know what? I could be listing these all day. Let me just put it this way. There are a lot of reasons in this day and age why someone like me would rather chew off their own arm than pay for the worst transport experience of their life aboard a jet airliner. Oh, and let me add that if the technology aboard the airplane were to malfunction catastrophically, it could lead to the whole thing dropping out of the sky with no survivors. However, on a ship, if technology fails catastrophically, then the ship is set adrift at sea where another ship can come to the rescue. It might be a terrible experience, like those who had to live on that cruise ship that became Poop Central, but you'll very likely live to tell the tale and be compensated for it. So you might wonder why, if it is so terrible, the airline industry is growing so rapidly. That brings me to my next point. There is still a high demand to get around. Let's put it this way. There is a huge amount of people that fly from LA to San Francisco, and the amount is only growing. But just as there are huge amounts of people booking those flights and driving up the cost of a ticket, there are just as many people, if not more, who want to travel, but do not see a decent way of getting there besides using an airplane. This is why the high-speed rail industry is experiencing a boom. That is a subject with its own controversies and issues, but the point is that the idea of a high-speed train gives you the option to not take a plane. If we're talking about crossing the North Atlantic to get from North America to Europe, the most efficient way is by plane. But as costs rise and the experience of flying worsens, more and more people such as myself will be looking for an alternative. I plan to take a trip to the UK to film and vlog lots of historic places. There's a link below if you want to donate to help me book that trip a lot sooner. Just a shameless plug for you. But when I considered flying there, I decided I just didn't want to. In my honest opinion, just my take on it, Flying to the UK is not something that would be my first choice. That's how much I hate the experience of flying. That's why I chose my transit method to be aboard the Queen Mary too. Her regularly scheduled crossings and luxury experience is something that appeals to me. Though I will admit, the crossing is quite pricey. The cheapest passenger cabin is only a little bit more expensive than an airplane ticket, and I get a week to relax on my way there. The only thing is that not everyone has the luxury to spend a week at sea. But let me put it this way. The Queen Mary II was designed to cross the North Atlantic in five days. But in recent years, they've slowed her down to just about seven to eight days. The reason being that her passengers aren't in any rush to get across the ocean. But if they were, she could easily speed up. If there was a high enough demand for ocean travel, the industry would build ships that would go faster than Queen Mary II. Heck, they might even build a ship that could match the high speeds that the SS United States was once capable of. So now you might be wondering, well, Alex, if people really preferred sailing on Queen Mary II to get across the Atlantic, then why don't we see it? 
To which that brings me to my final point. A transatlantic crossing on Queen Mary 2 is so popular, it's booked up almost a whole year in advance. When I save up the money I need to take that voyage, I have to book the voyage at least nine months ahead of time because the ship is so darn popular. There is a huge demand for people to take the transatlantic crossing aboard the ship. Now, it may not always be working class people, but don't be fooled into thinking that all of Queen Mary 2's passengers are wealthy. They aren't. Just look at all the travel vloggers who chose to take a crossing aboard the ship. They almost always say that the passengers are just regular people who saved up their money over time. So it is possible to do it. And in the old days of transatlantic travel, there were tons of ships competing against each other, which helped to maintain competitive prices and prevented them from ballooning out of control. The original RMS Queen Mary got everyone across the Atlantic in less than four days, and a third-class ticket was reasonable. So when people ask me if Cunard will build another ocean liner to succeed QM2, not only do I think they will, but I think they may do it even sooner than you'd expect. I'd say, within 10 years, Queen Mary 2 may have a more modern running mate, helping to keep up with the growing demand. If you ask me what I think the transport industry will look like in 10 years, I say Cunard might have two ocean liners moving people across the North Atlantic on regularly scheduled crossings, while other companies might have at least one ocean liner in their fleet helping to move people across the most popular transit routes of the world. These ships may have a service speed of at least 28 knots, if not more, and will cater to people who can spare the time to get to their destination. I'm not saying it will be a huge return of the industry, but I am saying there will be enough demand to support a small renaissance of the ocean liner. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more videos about the age of steam.